From Dan Brown's best-selling The Da Vinci Code series, casting doubt on the New Testament canon, to media-savvy atheists like Sam Harris, captivating this generation with a mix of charisma and new atheist ideologies, it's no wonder the U.S. has seen a rapid decline in Christianity. In 2019, just 65% of American adults describe themselves as Christian, down 12 percentage points over the decade. Meanwhile, the rise of Darwinian evolution and the belief that science leaves no room for God have made it difficult for young students to emerge from their education with any faith intact. In fact, just 30% of academic scientists in America identify as Christian, with 70% likely holding biases that conflict with religion. Many atheist professors and scholars continue to challenge the authenticity of the New Testament. Notably, Bart Ehrman, who is a professor of New Testament studies at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, has written numerous New York Times best-selling books, including Misquoting Jesus and How Jesus Became God, all of which trying to discredit the New Testament as we have it today. Is he right to discount the New Testament's portrayal of history? Is Christianity based on a book of myths and legends that have been doctored and manipulated throughout history? Or can we honestly say that the New Testament is a reliable source of the life and teachings of Jesus? In this video, I will take a look at a few of the arguments for and against the reliability of the New Testament. I'll cover competing worldviews, textual issues, manuscript variants, dating controversies, and discrepancies between the four Gospels. Perhaps a clear examination of the facts can bring some clarity to whether the New Testament can be trusted as a source for truthful historical information. The argument of whether the New Testament is reliable cannot commence without first acknowledging the competing worldviews at hand. While there are many definitions describing what a worldview is, I will stick with the one defined in James W. Sire's book, Naming the Elephant, Worldview as a Concept. Sire states that a worldview is a set of presuppositions, or assumptions which may be true, partially true, or entirely false, which we hold, consciously or subconsciously, consistently or inconsistently, about the makeup of our world. So the two competing worldviews at odds in the debate over the reliability of the New Testament, generally speaking, include sets of presuppositions from naturalism and Christianity. On the one end of the spectrum we have naturalism, which is the belief that only the natural world exists. This view is the dominant view among historians, secular scholars, and even those within the field of religious studies. It holds that miracles are impossible and therefore must be discounted or explained away by natural causes when examining history. Ehrman states that as a historian, he cannot ever come to the conclusion that a miracle occurred, even if it did, because it contradicts the normal workings of nature. Ehrman's view raises a problem for Christianity, as the New Testament documents make the most famous miracle claim in history, the resurrection of Jesus, which is the focal point of the New Testament. On the other end of the worldview spectrum, we have the Christian worldview, or belief in a personal, ethical, self-revealing, holy God who is the creator of the world, has an imminent presence in it, and is transcendent over it. This worldview, held by the apparent authors of the New Testament, leaves room for miracles, and it's largely why many critics of Christianity discount the historicity of the New Testament altogether. However, this extreme view is not held by the majority of the academic world. For example, archaeologists regularly reference the New Testament when searching for dig sites and do not discount the historicity of the New Testament simply because of its supernatural claims. Eilat Mazar, a leading Israeli archaeologist who is not religious, calls the entire Bible, including the New Testament, a historical source. She says, one of the many things I learned from my grandfather was how to relate to the biblical text pour over it again and again, for it contains within it descriptions of genuine historical reality. It's not just archaeologists that share Mazar's conclusion. Many historians and scholars view the Gospels as reliable because the writings within them exhibit verisimilitude, 
More clearly, the subject matter of the writings mirrors that of what we know about the people and places of the period in which they describe. According to the majority of scholars, there is much evidence of the New Testament authors having familiarity of the topography and geography, as well as knowledge of the culture and customs of the people during that period of time. Skeptics argue that the New Testament cannot be reliable because of the sheer number of textual variants among the Gospel manuscripts. Ehrman states in his book Misquoting Jesus that there are more textual variants than there are words in the New Testament. He's right about that. In fact, scholars have identified as many as 300 to 400,000 variants among all the manuscripts in antiquity. These variations include differences in spelling, word order, omission, addition, substitution, or revision. However, Dr. Daniel Wallace, with the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts, a prolific organization that focuses on discovering, photographing, and cataloging ancient Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, he points out that the vast majority of the variants, about 99%, are not even translatable, with the largest single group of variants being spelling modifications. Wallace states, uh, I'd say over 99%, in fact, well over 99% of all of our textual variants are either not meaningful, that is, they don't affect the meaning of the text, or not viable, that is, they don't have any likelihood of going back to the original, or both. Interestingly, the large number of variants among ancient New Testament manuscripts is due in part to the fact that so many manuscripts have been discovered. In fact, archaeologists have unearthed more than 5,800 complete or fragmented Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, far more than any other works of antiquity in history. Wallace states that on average, archaeologists have about half a dozen manuscripts for the average classical Greek author. We have maybe half a dozen manuscripts for the average classical author, and let's say we had as many as 15 manuscripts for the average classical Greek author that, that still exist. You stack those up, they'd be about four feet high. Mm -hmm. If you stack up the New Testament manuscripts, the Greek ones as well as uh, early translations, which all count as manuscripts into Latin and Coptic and Syriac and Georgian and Gothic and Ethiopic and all that, it'll be about uh, a mile and a quarter high. Mm. Four feet versus a mile and a quarter. So we have a lot more manuscripts than they do. We have an embarrassment of riches and they have a dearth of evidence. But besides that, the average classical author, we're waiting 500 to 1,000 years before we even see one copy. Mm -hmm. For the New Testament manuscripts, we're waiting a mere two or three decades, and then we get our first copy. On the surface, the number of textual variants can be alarming for the Christian. However, focusing solely on the number of textual variants does not paint a clear picture and can be misleading. The plurality of texts is actually a good thing. It enables scholars to put the puzzle pieces together by comparing and contrasting the documents. A consensus among scholars affirms the practice of textual criticism to piece together the original text as atheological and grounded purely in science. If scholars had but a few copies to analyze, it would be impossible to know what the original document said. It is widely confirmed that New Testament scholars and textual critics have recovered about 95%, that's 95% of the New Testament's original form. And as we've already covered, the vast majority of the uncertainties are very minor. The dating of the New Testament is of utmost importance because it can either support the argument that the documents were later myths of fiction or the argument that they were early historical eyewitness accounts, like they claim to be. A respectable yardstick for measuring the length of time for a myth to develop can be found in Awin Sherwin White's work, Roman Society and Roman Law in the New Testament. In the book, he uses the history writings of Herodotus from the mid-5th century BC to support his argument for the historicity of the New Testament Gospels. Herodotus's history, he states, allows for scholarly historians like himself to test the tempo of myth-making to see how long it would take for mythical tendency to overcome the solid historicity of the oral tradition. The results of his testing concluded that it would take the passing of more than two generations before myths could be introduced, develop, and even remain in the record of a historical person. Sherwin White, who was not a Christian, doesn't come to this conclusion lightly. In fact, he draws on several parallels between Herodotus' history and the New Testament Gospels, in addition to his timeline defense. When looking at the New Testament's timeline, Christian scholars typically agree on the dating of the Synoptic Gospels. 
with a range that falls between the late 50s and 90 AD. Their critical colleagues would hold to a range that falls anywhere between roughly 10 years later and beyond, with widespread consensus of dating the Gospel of John to about 95 AD. However, scholarly consensus places Paul's letters prior to the Gospels, between the 40s and 50s AD. If these dates are in fact correct, like the majority of scholars attest to, we're looking at perhaps less than 10 years from Jesus' death to Paul's first epistle, and about 35 to 65 years for the Gospels. According to Sherwin White's myth-making analysis, the New Testament leans favorably toward a narrative account. Many scholars have pointed out a number of discrepancies among the Gospels, claiming to have found mistakes. Ehrman states on his blog that the Bible is full of mistakes, contradictions, and discrepancies of various kinds. If there are so many mistakes in the New Testament, how can anyone in academia take them seriously? Clearly we've seen that a number of scholars hold the manuscripts to be reliable. So what is it? Perhaps Ehrman's statement is both right and wrong. Modern scholars should be reminded not to inject today's culture into the text. It has been discovered that the method and practice of teaching during the time of the New Testament writings was much different than it is today. While modernity puts a strong emphasis on precise recordings of events with strict chronology and sequence, perhaps due to the availability of video recordings and other forms of modern communications, the Jewish and Greco-Roman cultures from late antiquity valued the overall meaning of a message rather than the exact particulars of each sequence of events. Jesus' teachings match this style, and he adapted it according to the situation he found himself in all without losing the overall meaning of his message. He not only taught this way, but he taught his disciples to follow suit. The Jews of that time would have been largely influenced by the Greeks, who began their education by memorizing krea, or short anecdotes, in which a character says or does something of particular value. The useful lessons learned from the krea would then be inserted into arguments or strung together with several other krea to make a point. In doing so, the student is free to manipulate or change the end or the beginning so long as he retains the original meaning. Modern scholars have discovered the Krea in the New Testament writings and have been found to be the source of many of the discrepancies. No doubt when the Gospel writers utilized the Krea to adapt, edit, cluster, and contextualize the various teachings of Jesus, their parallel and overlapping accounts would have created variations according to each of their styles. This analysis is by far not a complete survey of the available arguments for or against the reliability of the New Testament. However, we can see from the data collected that some of the strongest arguments against the reliability and historicity of the New Testament documents do not discredit it. In fact, we see strong evidence that the text is reliable and that today's scholars not only regularly depend on the manuscripts for locating archaeological digs, but also confirm the accuracy of the text when studying the local cultures and customs of people during that time.